by our profession. So I'm one of those analytical type people. But what I did realize, you know, after completing my, my high level studies, my postgraduate studies, that working hard and getting all the paperwork you need through university is not necessarily the answer. So that led me on a journey. Uh, ironically, you just mentioned now that, you know, the Awaken Your Financial Genius. Um, I read uh, Robert Ke one of Robert Kiyosaki's books. It was November 2012, just after I finished my master's degree. And that, that kind of opened up a whole new world for me in terms of how people make money in the business and investor side of things. The thing that always confused me is how do you how do you start your own business with with relatively low capital or alternatively become an investor but start small so i went and i started my own business and i've got a consulting business and i've got a few other business concerns but what what intrigued me about cryptos is it it kind of leveled the playing field so a lot of guys couldn't get involved in property and things like that purely because they maybe didn't have access to funding and stuff like that. But cryptos did level the playing field in that the average Joe in the street could get involved. So that's, that's pretty much what intrigued me about cryptos to start. And we'll get into the, the detail a little bit more later. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I started my journey and you know, what got me interested in cryptocurrencies. Great. Thank you very much for that, Robert. Um, Barry has now joined us. Barry. Um, hey. hey, everybody. How are you doing? Good, good. All good, yeah. So, um, so welcome to this evening's call. And um, I can see that Marlon has already introduced uh, our guest for this evening, Rob. So, Rob, welcome to... Welcome to this uh, to this webinar. Great, uh, great to to have you on it. So um, yeah, and um, a number of a number of you have asked over the last couple of weeks um, um, to to talk a little bit about crypto. I told you I know nothing about it. I have a couple of uh, friends and colleagues who know a lot about it. Rob is a Rob is a, a friend of mine, and when we were having breakfast yesterday morning. Marlon, uh, Marlon and I were chatting and he said, you know, we chatted about crypto and I happened to have a meeting with Rob straight away after that and said, hey, would you uh, mind joining us tomorrow night and talk to us a little bit about cryptocurrency? And, um, you know, he's, uh, he, knows, he knows a bit, a bit about the subject, uh, quite a lot about the subject actually, and definitely a heck of a lot more than, uh, than I do. Um, you know, for me, I think Rob, uh, Rob knows me. For me, I, I'm not naive enough to say it's something that's going away. Um, I, you know, these things are very real, and uh, uh, that's whatever you want to invest in, make sure you learn, study, and understand. And, uh, and if this is something you prepare to learn, study, and understand, then, um, then that might be. That might be a, a path for you to for you to go. So, uh, so Rob, welcome, and uh, great having you on the call. Thanks, Barry. So, um, let's kick off with uh, with give us give us a basic description. What is cryptocurrency? You know, because I think I hear a lot of time people call it's like it's like Hoover and a, it's like like Hoover and a and a you know Hoover becomes a generic name. I think people tend to seem to call Bitcoin, but get it mistaken for crypto. And crypto, Bitcoin is just part of the cryptocurrency world, isn't it? Yeah, look, so the two, the two separating issues that people generally get confused with is the blockchain and cryptos or Bitcoin as they call it generically. What you need to understand first and foremost is Bitcoin is the first, it was first mined or the first Bitcoin was manufactured, if we could call it that, in 2009. And since then, various other alternative coins have entered the fray. So I checked, I think it was on Monday when I spoke to you, there were over 1,700 different altcoins on the market. 
And most people are only aware of the, the upper echelon type coins, the Bitcoins, the Ethereums and that type of thing. But there are a lot of different coins on the market. What we need to consider though is Bitcoin will only ever be a token of value or a store of value or a, a, a medium of exchange. Whereas the other old coins available in the market are, are typically like shares in a company. So they've got a function, they've got a purpose, and their value is defined by that function and purpose. So that's the difference between Bitcoin and the other altcoins. And then the blockchain technology is essentially the, the ledger system, which records the double entries like we know standard accounting to be. Instead, it uses computer software programs and advanced algorithms. And it's unbreakable. And that's, that's where the trust comes in and the secureness of the networks come in. So Bitcoin has its own blockchain, uh, blockchain 2.0, which they call the most more advanced, faster blockchain is the Ethereum blockchain. But there's several other iterations of the blockchain that private programmers and developers have developed for their own specific coins. Most of them built on the Ethereum blockchain technology. So that's, that's the difference. So you've got your, your blockchain, which is your underpinning technology, your ledger system, and then you've got your tokens, which is your, your value associated with that particular token or crypto. So, uh, yeah, that's a, basically, in a nutshell, the differential between the two. Okay, great. So when it comes to, when it comes to crypto as a, um, uh, as a currency, Mm -hmm. um, how does that work? Well, look, you know, if we go back, I think to, to understand it a bit better in, in, the, in the context of the 21st century, if we go back and we look at mediums of exchange historically, uh, we go back to the 1600s or the 1500s, people used to use livestock and seashells as a medium of exchange. Then we, we fast forward to the 17th or 18th century, we're carrying around cows and chickens became a bit cumbersome. And then they introduced coins. Uh, then the Venedicis in Florence introduced the IU or the credit system as we know it. In the modern world, we come with notes. And then plastic was introduced in the States in the 50s. Now, back in the early days, if, if I determined that one cow was worth 10 chickens, that, that pretty much happened as a system of supply and demand. Um, so Bitcoin primarily operates on the same basis, although there's a lot of um, talk in the media these days that big money is manipulating prices, but inherently it's the purest form of, of supply and demand and it's people's money. So it's based on pretty much um, how, many, how many people are buying Bitcoin, how many people are exchanging their fiat currency for cryptos on any given day, which affects the price. and in terms of, of using it or monetizing it in, 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 the, you know, in the modern world, a lot of companies have come on board, a lot of third party uh, Visa, MasterCard service type providers where you can actually order cards backed by your cryptos. Some shopping sites accept, accept cryptos, specifically Bitcoin directly for payment. I know some of the bigger companies uh, like Lamborghini and stuff like that, they also accept payment in Bitcoin directly. So it's a medium of exchange. Um, it's people's money. It's, it's web-based money. And the value is pretty much determined by supply and demand if we take the conspiracy theories out of the equation. And the more and more people are using it and getting to know what it's about, the, the more people are transacting it with, with the coin itself. So that's pretty much it summarized how, how people use it in the 21st century. Okay, cool. So, I, I mean, this is a, this is a very, this is a very new technology. I mean, Bitcoin is a decade old, if I'm right. Yeah, pretty 2009. Much. So yeah, next year it'll be two uh, decade. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's a very, it's a very new concept and it's really, it's really starting to, morph and mold itself into where it's going. So one of the concerns from people is, what are the chances of it being regulated by governments? Look, um, 
from a government perspective, I, I believe they have to regulate it. And I say that because I think they know it's going nowhere. And at the end of the day, they have to get their cut out of it somehow. But regulation isn't necessarily a bad thing. Or let me say over-regulation isn't, isn't great, but some type of regulation is needed. Um, the nice thing about regulation is when these, these, these rules come into play, people, the average Joe on the street that's, that's been undecided as to the future of these cryptos is going to start to listen a little bit more because they're going to think to themselves, okay, well, if the governments are spending this much time and effort to regulate these cryptos, they potentially know something I do not know. So what I believe will happen in that instance is the demand for the coin. And, and when I say coin, it can be any coin that you're interested in and the regulations around that particular coin. Um, I believe the demand for the coin will go up and, and it will benefit the price. So regulation isn't bad. A, a lot of guys are worried about regulation. I've had a lot of guys moaning about it to me. But the thing is this, and I mentioned it to you yesterday, I'd rather have 60 or 70 percent of a, a, a bitcoin that's valued at 300 400 thousand dollars than a hundred percent of a bitcoin that stays at eight thousand dollars so it's it's all about context and how you look at it but i do believe some type of regulation is good and is also needed to some degree okay good good so dirk asked the question he says from his limited knowledge it seems that XRP or Ripple is the only alt currency based on an actual financial system. Is this correct? Uh, let me just then I would assume it would be better long term play. Look, there is a lot of uh, um, talks in the industry that Ripple is back, backed by the big banks. Um, I don't, the only thing for me with Ripple is it's not mineable okay so when i say mineable you don't need a network of people around the world manufacturing this coin whoever developed ripple created x amount of ripple and that's what they say is available i don't i haven't read their white paper or anything along those lines but ripple could be a good short-term play not necessarily a long-term play because there might be some big institutional money going into it in the short term as with bitcoin um but ripple is said to be backed by some some big entities i don't know what the truth is behind that i haven't really investigated that much um i do have a, a small interest in ripple nothing substantial but it will be interesting to see how ripple plays out as a unmineable altcoin so, so can you explain to us when you talk about mining, what do yes. you mean? Okay, so to put this as, as plainly as I, I potentially can, we all know the story of the, the nursery story of the kid's story of the goose and the golden egg, okay? So I, I always ask people, if you had the money, would you buy the goose or would you buy 10 golden eggs? And 95% of people always say to me, the goose. And I ask them why. They say, because it's going to keep on laying those golden eggs. So there's three ways to get involved in the crypto space. And I'll get back to the goose and the golden egg now. But it's buy and hold. So you buy a Bitcoin or a tenth of a Bitcoin. You hold it for a year or two and you sell it off at a gate. There's trading of Bitcoin. You can do. So that's like trading stocks and shares. So you, you, can buy, well, you, yeah, can buy, you can buy stocks, you sit on them for six months, you sell them when they go up and you make, make a return on your investment. 100%. So it's a big chunk of capital gain on, on that play. Then you get the, the, the more um, risky type approach in my view, which is your day traders. So they're buying and putting in buy and sell orders every day and they're trying to make small margins. If they make 10 gains in a day at 1%, they've made their 10% for the day. Risky, but some guys are really good at it and some guys are making some really good money doing it. It's not what I, I favor. And then you get mining. Now mining involves buying a piece of computer hardware, 
installing a program into it, and I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible, that, that, pro, that software runs and it basically validates online transactions. So there will be thousands of Bitcoin transactions happening every day. People buying, selling, paying with, sending to other people. And because it's a peer-to-peer -peer system, then in that network, that ledger system, computers have to validate those transactions. And if you validate a certain amount, you will be paid or rewarded in Bitcoin for the work that your computers have done in the network, your contribution. Okay. So mining in summary is you getting rewarded in the token of your choice for buying equipment that keeps the network stable and trusted. So the more computers you have validating more transactions, because it requires capacity like bandwidth for internet speed. It requires capacity and the more capacity you have, the more transactions you can validate. And the more transactions you can validate daily, the more reward you get. So that's mining. So that goes back to the goose and the golden egg. The mining equipment is like the goose. Yes, you buy the equipment like you would buy the goose, but it keeps on laying golden eggs or bitcoins based on how many transactions your collective amount of equipment can validate on a daily basis. So that's a very high level explanation of what mining entails. Okay, great. So in order to mine, there's a number of ways you can do well. Is there a number of ways you can do it, aren't there? Yes, there, 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 there are a number of ways. Um, in the beginning, when Bitcoin first came about, um, sorry, I just read another transaction, uh, another comment here. Um, when Bitcoin came about, people were mining off their, their, their gaming computers because the difficulty level to solve that al algorithm was really, really low. Um, so people have used their own personal computers in the past. Then the difficulty got a little bit harder and people started buying application specific integrated circuit chips and they put them in machines in their garages and their storerooms and we're mining from home. But today, because the difficulty is so hard to solve these the, or to validate these transactions, the only people that are really sustainably mining are the people that are mining as a collective. So massive, massive warehouses full of mining equipment. So creating, so creating leverage, really? Yes. So it's an ecosystem okay. that's created. Uh, people all contribute to the community, the crowd, and they all mine collectively and distribute proportionately to the the computing power their systems have as individuals. Okay, cool. So I think one of the things that I've seen and in business being around different types of businesses and, and that sort of and that sort of stuff is um, mm -hmm. is that sometimes I think people get confused that cryptocurrency is network marketing. Whereas cryptocurrency is cryptocurrency and there are network marketing businesses that leverage various types of cryptocurrencies in order to create a network marketing business yes hundred percent hundred percent so it's the okay. same it's the same adage as you're going to this game and there's this product on the shelves that are not part of a network marketing company but then there's other network marketing companies that focus on similar product to build their organization doesn't mean that the one on the shelves okay. of this game is network marketing it's just the business model of some companies Okay, brilliant. Okay, good. So, um, okay, so Dirk asked the question, do you perhaps have the ratio of transactions validated versus the reward received? Um, I, I don't personally, uh, it's available online, um, but it's, it's, a, it's um, you it would actually have to know what you're looking at. It's not like something you could, um, you could see all the transactions validated on the blockchain, but, um, it won't be able to tell you that would you would probably see as a collective what that mining pool has been rewarded in Bitcoin. But I can tell you over the last month or two, 
um, the mining difficulty has gone up substantially. So basically, in a nutshell, if you take all the computers mining Bitcoin around the world, and all those computers collectively validate 2016 transactions in less than two weeks, they increase the difficulty. If they take longer than two weeks to validate 2016 transactions, they decrease the difficulty. And the reason that difficulty is in play is because the way Satoshi wrote the program is the last Bitcoin will be mined in the year 2140. So I call it 122 years from now. And in order to maintain that date, he has to ensure that there's not too many Bitcoin being released every two weeks as rewards. There has to be a, a predetermined release of these coins over the next 120 years to make sure that that timeline is kept. So I don't, I don't personally have all the rewards of all the mining pools and stuff, but I can, I can tell you it fluctuates. Last year, my mining equipment did very, very well, but over the last three, four months, it's taken a serious dive. And that's a combination of two things. The Bitcoin price hasn't climbed quite quickly in, in, in this first, just past the first half of the year, and the difficulty has increased substantially. So if your difficulty goes up and your price stays stagnant, even though you're getting rewarded pieces of a Bitcoin, your price of that coin is not going up. So it, it's not generating as great a rewards as it potentially did last year when the difficulty was low, but the value of the coin was $15,000 per coin. So back to your question, Dirk, there's ways to find that information. But it changes so rapidly. You you know you can have a look at the graphs on crypto compare and stuff like that, and get a feel for things like that. You can even Google mining difficulty, and you can find the tables how the difficulties increased and decreased over the the last nine years. But I don't look at that. I really don't. I, it's it's a full time job just doing those analytics. But if that's your thing, if you I know some guys enjoy doing that, then by all means you can find those answers. Cool. Thanks, Rob. So, Rob, when it comes to mining, mining yes. has fixed overheads or it has variable overheads like any business. Yes. Um. Look, it depends on the mining concern that you're mining with. Um, okay. I, I, I know it's not part of this question, but I did see Karun asked, he said several mines are competing for the same block and the first decide gets the coin for that block, is that correct? And what he's saying there is, is true. So if you've got more hashing power, you're gonna win that block. It's like water, it's a path of least resistance. But the reason I refer to that is, <clears throat> Some mining concerns do that up front. So they don't calculate in terms of longevity of the business model, or do they still want to be in the game 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now? They look at it, well, how can we get into this industry, get as much hashing power as possible, and just rip into it for two, three years, get as much gain out, but after two, three years, they can't compete anymore because they haven't done the sustainability calcs. Then they start finding out that the cost of running that warehouse is starting to far exceed their reward. So some mines have fixed rewards, some mines have monthly, um, sorry, fixed charges, monthly charges, some mines charge you upfront for the maintenance and stuff like that. So it does differ from, from entity to entity, but it should have varying, like you said, Barry, I mean, if you've got 10 machines one month and all of a sudden your your operation expands to 30 machines that month, you're going to have a massive spark in electricity yeah. and maintenance cost. So that's logical, yes, 100%. So, you're, so, so that I, I think, and, and I don't think it's just me, but I think when I first started looking at this, the perception was is, is that you sort of run a computer and these sort of uh, these uh, Cryptos just sort of arrived because you start mining them, but then the more I learned about this, I realized that you it, you set up real hardware concerns. There, there is all the same financial 
uh, constraints. There's like any business, there's depreciation, there's a whole lot yes. that goes with it, replacing computers, upgrading computers, doing all that sort of stuff, electricity, running costs. Um, Theft, all that type of all stuff. That, sort of that adds that adds cost to running that to running that concern. So, so uh, okay, great. So Dirk's other question is, if he gets top developers, can he develop and calculate the uh, algorithm quicker, or does everyone use the same? It's all the same. It's all the same algorithm. So the separator is your 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 ha your hashing power. So how many machines do you have? So anyone can download that algorithm off the web as what the guys did in the beginning. They downloaded it off the web, they used their gaming computers and they started running it. But what they realized, their processing speed couldn't keep up. So it's just about your hashing power that sets the mining so, concerns apart. So Rob, it's like, um, it's like, it's like mining for diamonds in the big hole when, uh, when they all went to Kimberley. The guys were the most, the, the, the pipe was in the same place. They all, all had access to the same pipe. But the guys that had, had, more, that had more staff, more miners, more explosives, and, uh, and more money behind them it, were, were able to benefit from the process a lot quicker than anybody else. Yeah, it's exactly that story. I mean, in the, in the, in the early days, you could work that, walk down the streets in central Joburg and pick up little gold nuggets. That was yep. the early days of Bitcoin. Now actually you're using Acer laptops to get the Bitcoin. Now, like you rightfully said, it's only the guys with the massive back actors, expertise, skill sets, money that are going to get into it. So you've got to find the right entity to mine with. Yeah. You can still go it alone. I'm not saying that you can't mine by yourself, but what you're going to find, and I know this because I've got family and friends trying to do it, they go through bouts of on and off. So when the price is really high and the difficulty is really low, the machines are on for a week. As soon as there's a slight fluctuation either way, the machines are off again. Okay. So it becomes a, a very hands-on uh, operation to mine for yourself because you just, you just can't contribute enough hashing power to a certain mining pool. And that and that's effectively the problem. But yes, the analogy of mining is exactly where we are today. So, Robert, uh, I I don't want you to mention any company that you're involved with or anything like that because being this a very open platform, this is this is not about promoting any business. But in terms of in terms of companies that you could join, become part of, there's a massive array of different companies that are playing in the in the crypto mining space that you could uh, that you could join, become part of, that would allow you to be able to create leverage. Give me, give us a couple of pointers on what you would suggest to, uh, to help someone if they were gonna choose a partner to join in terms of getting involved in mining. Okay, so what I would look at is first of all the history of the company obviously i'd look at the transparency of the company how long they've been around who's who's at the helm who's managing the ship um i would look i would also look to speak to people that are that are other involved in mining and mining with that concern then i'd is a secondary thing it's just a, a monetary thing you know you look at the different packages they offer what type of capacity they're giving you for those packages um and yeah just just do some due diligence online like i did i mean it's you know and then also your gut does play a part in it so have a look at it but what i also suggest is where i went wrong when you get started mining don't start with money you can't afford to get started with. That's the guiding principle. Start with what's, what's safe for you. And if something goes wrong, it's not going to affect your lifestyle in any way. And test that ecosystem of theirs. So when I say test, don't just let them show you figures that, okay, yeah, you've mined X, but we did it, this with that. And you need to be able to mine and withdraw. And that's, that's the differentiator. You need to make sure that if you've mined even 
one of a Bitcoin over a week, you can draw some of it or a portion of it, but it, it comes out of the entity. Because, you know, as we all know, there are certain scams going around that when it comes to drawing time and you want to pull your coin out, there's this story and this problem and, you know, there's this code that's blocked. And so you need to just make sure that you can get your coin out as, as, a, as a first principle. But like I said, do you do diligence? See how much they're charging. If you're not sure about the running costs, ask the question. Ask the question of the people that you're speaking to about the entity and say, how do you guys manage your running costs? You know, how do you charge me for it? I'm not going to get rewarded X. And then all of a sudden I get a bill at the end of the month that I wasn't foreseeing. So ask them all the questions that you have and, and the way they answer you and the openness that they display is also a good indicator. Because sometimes when you start pressing a little bit hard and asking some, some questions that they don't like, you, you can see the real nature of what you're dealing with. So yeah, that's where your gut feel comes into it. Just, just go with that and listen to it. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. So, um, yeah, let's uh, pick up another one here from Dirk. I have a couple of servers in a data center that, that is available. Do you know of any restrictions from data centers for doing this? I.e., is it seen as gaming or gambling? And for instance, the servers need to be hosted overseas, etc. cetera. Um, I, I'm a personally aware of uh, any restrictions on it. Um, it's not considered gambling in, in, in any sense or gaming in any sense. But I don't know if you're asking, so do you want to do you want to host it yourself? Do you want to plug them in yourself and download the algorithm? Or do you want someone else to host? Because there is an entity in South Africa that I don't mind in South Africa, and I'm not going to mention names, but there is an entity in South Africa that I've heard will assist you with hosting your equipment. I don't mind with them either, but I do know of them and they, they, they're quite reputable. So if, if that's your intention, you, you'll find them pretty easy on, on the internet that they'll host your equipment for you. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. So just cool. uh, wrapping it up, guys, anyone else got any other questions that, that you'd like to put to Rob before? We finished off uh, before we finish off, and just uh, yeah, just to ask you, how many of you have found this evening around crypto interesting, and how has it helped you answer some of the questions that that maybe maybe you had, or just given you a little bit of a broader perspective on what this whole cryptocurrency is? As Robert Kiyosaki says, it's um, you know, gold and silver is God's money. Fiat currency is government's money and crypto is people's money. So, you know, for me, definitely something that I am taking a lot of notes around um, and starting to find out more and learn more about it and, uh, and would like to continue on this. So, Rob, the feedback, great. Thank you very much for your feedback awesome. tonight. Thank you for, uh, for being with us. Um, and yeah, all the questions. Question. <laughs> all the questions about to start with for investing on average at present. I, I think I'm going to actually answer that. It depends on how much money you have available. Like any investment, Dillian, you know, there's certain costs for getting involved. But it, in in order to buy a cryptocurrency, um, you can start rob at very very low amounts. Yes. Yeah, um, some mining concerns, obviously, uh, you know, I have to be respectful of the forum we're on, but some mining concerns start as low as a little as uh, a couple of hundred bucks. Okay, good. And, and I mean, just to go in and buy a crypto, for example, you can, you can invest a couple of hundred bucks to get started. Or you, oh, can you can start with 50 bucks. You 50 can buy bucks. 50 rands yeah. worth of Bitcoin, yeah, on Luna. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, there's an opportunity to... To, again, it comes down to how much do you want to invest? What is it that you want to invest? And uh, and how much are you prepared to, to how much do you want to make and how much are you prepared to lose if, if, if and how it doesn't, it doesn't work? But again, I'll come down to the same thing as Robert says. What are you prepared to study? Uh, what are you prepared to study? What are you prepared to understand? Who are you prepared to surround yourself with in order to be able to get that? And if I can just add there, Barry, um, when I got started my crypto journey, I got taken for quite a bit of money. Um, 
but the school fees I paid in that experience has made me more money over this last two and a half years than I ever lost it on the outset. So I'm not saying that you need to go big into crypto, but what I am saying is sometimes the journey does involve, I mean, I'm not saying 100,000 Rand or 200,000 Rand, but 500 odd Rand, open a trading account, open a Luna account or whatever altcoin trader and see how these platforms work, how you buy and sell Bitcoin. Um, these are generic trading accounts, guys. They're not any mining concern. So you can still learn how to deal with Bitcoin and understand how it works. So at least one day you can say, I learned. I decided to learn and I decided to see what's going on. It's the only way I learned. When I started with, with Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, trading, literally the only thing I knew about Bitcoin was how to spell it. But by being involved over the last two and a half years, I've, I've learned a great deal. I've, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've lost quite a bit of money. I've made a bit of money. Um, but it's been good because the world is going that way. And you can only take advantage of opportunity if you're prepared. And the best time to start learning was yesterday. But if that didn't happen, it's tomorrow. Yeah, I think you, you make an interesting point there, Rob. So the question is, when should I have started my business? I've been <laughs> in corporate for 12 years. Well, maybe 12 years ago. The reality is it, you start when you're ready to start and you start when you've educated yourself in order to uh, in in order to get in order to get going. Hundred hmm. um, percent. Okay, cool. So, just a question um, from Dirk. Mm -hmm. You know, Rob. Rob, maybe um, maybe one or two resources, maybe a website or two that you could, uh, um, you could give people so they can go and learn more about crypto okay let me just switch here i'm going to write two to start with um cool. and then the other resource which i use all the time is youtube Obviously, you get some um, some funny people on YouTube, but within the first minute, you can you can potentially see um, if the discussion is going to add any value. But what I do urge you to do is even even if you come across something negative on cryptos on mining, listen to it and read it, because you can only start making informed decisions if you've heard about both sides of the coin. So even on YouTube. You know, I've watched some some guys running cryptos into the ground, talking about mining being a scam. I watch all of it because I need a balanced view from both sides to make up my own mind. So, so don't stay away from the negative stuff. Sometimes the negative stuff can be the better stuff because it, it does balance out the viewpoint for you. So, yeah, Crypto Compare is brilliant because it's got all the coins, it's got all the different wallets. Um, all the different cards you can use, all the different mining. It's got mining calculators. Just be careful with those mining calculators because they don't take running cost into account, which is massive. And then coin market cap, you can find any statistic you want on any coin from inception. So those are the two that I would start with. Um, but if there's anything specific, just literally Google has everything. That's, you know, um, that's how I learned most of the stuff in YouTube as well. It's a very good resource. Excellent, Rob. Thank you very much. So, no um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, for me, that was a lot of value. Great having, uh, great having Rob on. Um, and uh, yeah, really, uh, really great share, Rob. So, thank you so much for joining us this evening, bud. And, uh, and thank you for your insight. So, Thanks, did you guys get a lot of value out of, out of learning, learning more about um, Learning, learning more about crypto. So uh, what I'm going to tell you is Robin, Robin and I have a colleague who has built a highly, highly successful cryptocurrency business. She's, uh, she's one of our trainers. I think Rob knows who I'm talking about. Um, and, uh, and in two weeks' time, she's going to come on this call with me and she's going to talk about what it takes 
to build a highly successful crypto business. Um, would you say she's a great person to be able to speak about that, Rob? Yeah, hundred um, okay. percent. I think she's proof of what what can be achieved um, using cryptos as a disruptive technology and marrying it with business. Hundred yeah, percent. So her name is uh, Michelle Ventonda. She is uh, she's part of our team of of trainers and uh, and has built a very highly successful business in in this cryptocurrency space. So um, so she's gonna gonna bring on and talk about what is what is a crypto business because I think Rob has given us such a great baseline to uh, to work from tonight in terms of getting an understanding that is and and Rob if if I do be so bold to say and I think uh, Karen said it just now you only really just touched the surface tonight didn't you yes hundred uh, percent. I've intentionally so, try to keep it very, very hard. And and that and that's the best. Keep it simple. Keep it simple yep. to start off with. So you did an incredible job. So Rob, thank you, buddy. Pleasure. pleasure. Uh, as always, everybody, we're back here next week. Um, those of you that are interested in looking at the program that we run called Awaken Your Financial Genius, I've spoken about it a couple of times. A number of you on this call are on it. Uh, we start the first session in uh, next week on Thursday evening. If you are interested in it, this is uh, you have about a day to let us know if you would be interested in joining the program. And if you are interested in joining the program, it's by selection. So you need to um, go through a process of motivating why you'd want to be on the program. But if you are, just um, type in interested in AYFG and, uh, and either myself or Marlon will get a hold of you and chat to you about what that takes. So. If you're interested, type that in, interested in AYFG. It's a 10-week program um, around uh, how to awaken your financial genius, which, uh, which we've had some really, really great success with. Um, Rob, you just finished, you just finished the yeah. last program, haven't you? Yeah, if I can just add to that, you know, even someone like me that's knowledgeable on cryptos and what's happening in that space, the AYFG program just enabled me and educated me to the extent that I know how to use my knowledge better now with the principles from that program. So when, you know, if you're willing to go on the crypto journey, I would almost go so far as to say the AYFG journey is a must. Um, Cause once you marry those two principles and you see how, what Robert talks about in the program um, about being financially literate, um, those two principles, the cryptos and, and the financial literacy go hand in hand. So it's, it, it was an amazing, amazing course. Excellent. So guys, any other questions or comments before we finish off? Um, just uh, type in, if you got value out of this, just type in value, please uh, let you know. And, uh, and if you're getting value out of, out of these, out of these sessions, that would be, uh, that would be great. That would be great to know. Um, hey, and I uh, just seen Ray, and not just singling him out, but I've been trying to get hold of him. Ray, great, uh, great to see you on. Um, great to see you on this call. So uh, I know that you are doing awaken your financial genius. So it's so good to uh, good to have you have you on. Um, so Rob, again, thank you very much. Martin, pleasure, pleasure. Over to you, buddy. Uh, guys. Great, um, great having you. Um, great having you on tonight. Have a great, great evening. I'm going to hand you back to Marlon. Thanks, Barry. Thank you, Rob. Real great insight, and I'm um, looking forward to to chatting to you more about this and learning more from you. I'm sure, and I'm especially looking forward to hearing um, from from Michelle in two weeks' time. So, yeah. Um, everybody, you'll find this. I know. Um, I think it was Kim that that came in a bit late and didn't catch sort of everything. So the 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 recording of this will be up as of tomorrow, and you'll be getting emails. So please look out for that. Other than that, we'll be we we kind of change the the format. Hey Barry. So like uh, just to inform everyone now. So we we will be splitting up. 
the, the, the sales and the financial webinars with, instead of it being both on the same night, we're going to rather split them up. So we're going to, so next week we'll kick off with, with sales. And then the week after that will be um, Michelle with the, with the finance section. So look out in your emails because we will be updating you there. Um, other than that, have a good evening. See you around maybe at a cash flow evening that we will do soon or uh, the previews. Have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, Bye. Rob, again. Thanks, Marlon. Well hosted. Chat to you guys soon. Cheers. Thank you very much.